the Julian Lins Dubuque, Iowa, is pleased to invite Maestro Stanley DeRusha to the podium. He is an international conducting artist with performances throughout the United States, South America, Europe, and Asia. Thank you. You're very nice. <clears throat> So I entitled this, The Magic of Conducting. I'd like to take complete um, responsibility for that genuine um, title. But there's a great uh, series from Omnibus, which is way back when. And one of them was with Leonard Bernstein talking about conducting, which I invite everyone to watch because it's so instilling. And after he's done showing all these things and demonstrating all these things, his last words are, but the conducting career or the act of conducting is pure magic. So I thought, this is really good. The other thing, it, it, unfortunately because of my youth, I thought of Tinkerbell and uh, Mer Merlin the sorcerer. So Tinkerbell has got a, a baton even. I thought, how's that? And she has no trouble doing anything she wants. By the flick of her wrist, she does it. There are some conductors like that. But then there's Merlin, who studies, practices his art, tastes his potion, as long as it needs before he ever goes ahead. And that's the same as the conductor. Um, I think that all of us, perhaps all of them, as well as me, certainly, uh, began with a conducting class where we learned how to do this. And for the most part, they took a whole semester doing that, perhaps showing us some dynamics and other, other things. But, well, just, just a minute. So these might, these might be some of the things that we learned. Of. So I'm going to let the uh, band help me with this. So what's a staccato? What's a staccato? Short. Short. Okay. That's what we learned. That, that, uh, if you go back to the Italian, which you should with all of these terms we have, I mean, I, I, I invite you to look up um, Andantino and be shocked about what the answer is. But in Italian, staccato is separated. So when you look at the Egmont Overture of Beethoven and you see half notes with dots over them, you know it's not um, <laughs> um, short. So all of these other things we get, forte piano, you know, sforzando piano, sforzando, um, uh, um, forte, uh, and rin, forzando, we, everybody has a definition of it. Uh, there is no such thing. It doesn't apply. Uh, a sforzato for Mozart might just be an intensity of, of, of vibrato. Other places there'd be a little emphasis. It may be in a march, a whole other thing. So, if you take these as absolute, uh, you're making a huge mistake. So one other thing is, what is this? Slur. Slur. Anything else? Phrase. Ah, thank you very much. So when we look at this, we should ask ourselves, is this a phrase or is this legato? It could be both, of course. It could be legato, but it, the phrase could be marked. But there's no indication. Um, the other thing we think of in those situations is that we can't possibly use any kind of tonguing or breath push. But that's completely ridiculous. Um, violin players learn very quickly in their training that there's a, something called a portada, portado. And so if they're playing an up bow like this, pardon me, uh, and they want to kind of make it more clear or bring out a couple notes, they can keep the bow moving, but just, just add a little weight to that. Unfortunately, wind players never are introduced to this, which is a shame, but they can be. So you can articulate the whole thing even though it's legato. Legato is 
whatever you want to call it smooth, but it doesn't merit not, not um, articulating. So the other thing that, that we taught, we're taught in our um, first semester conducting is that the conductor is in charge and dictates the tempo. Well, here, um, what would you like to play? Well, just, just play concert B5, chord to notes. Can, can we do it one more time? Yeah, yeah. So you're saying, well, this is a professional group, they can do that. I'm sorry, an elementary school band can do that. The other thing that is, they don't really help us with is that the conductor's job is, in terms of time, is to establish it and change it, not to maintain it. And so if one is fascinated about themselves and they believe that they're actually in need, the group is in need of this, this is ridiculous. So the only way to help the players play this better is not to think of the big notes, but think of the subdivision. So if what we just played, quarter notes, and the subdivision is eighth note, we would play, can some of you just play some eighth notes and the rest of you play um, the other? You. So you can have a snare drummer play it, you can have something, but if the, if the ensemble learns how to feel subdivision, they'll play together. If not, it's a waste of time. So it has to happen from the beginning. So if, well not if, what separates classical music from practically other, except jazz, is that it needs to be interpreted. Uh, I'm giving, will give all of us uh, a number of quotes from very prominent conductors, composers, uh, and their interest in what happens with their music, and they understand it's going to happen, they want it to happen, they would insist if they were in the place, is that the music was interpreted. So if we really had a conducting program that had made any sense, it would start by helping the students in that class to understand and be able to replicate um, interpretation and create their own. And uh, that's very basic. If you wonder about the movement, uh, very seldom they suggest that perhaps the students could take a course, ballet, movement, uh, dance, so they feel more comfortable in control of their bodies before they actually become conductors. So if that were true, then you could ask in this first semester that the students can need to be able to sing for you or talk to you, but sing for you. What is their interpretation before they even move their hands? I mean, one time everybody laughed, but I was in my conducting class and I brought a janitor in. And I said, here, can you do this? And I gave him the baton and he went like that. That's how hard it is but yet we, we spend a whole semester on it. So there, need, there needs to be a whole renovation of what goes on. Oh, I hope. So I guess what I'm suggesting obviously is that the body and the face and the arms uh, are, are the essence of what goes on. There was a writer by the name of Leon Battisti Alberti, lived from 1404 to 1472. He said, movements of the soul are made known by movement, movements of the soul, I'll say it again. Movements of the soul are made known by movements. So. I mean, it's just obvious. We do this all the time, naturally. When we talk to each other, we express ourselves with our bodies, our hands, our faces. But somehow, when we get on the podium, we forget that that's very important.
The other thing that uh, conductors do normally is talk way too much. Um, obviously, if you're talking, you're not a conductor. It's like a mime who suddenly starts talking in the middle of his act. He ceases to be a mime. And so the, the less time spent talking, um, the better it is. So let's say, well, let me show you, uh, trumpets. Can you play staccato, please? OK, can we do it just, just a hair shorter? No, no, I, I think maybe it, it should be longer than that. OK, so, so you know, the conductor may go through 25 different versions. And then by the time the next rehearsal comes, they can't remember that, or maybe can't. So gesture is always better. So let's try this one more time. So uh, gesture is always more clear than words. So uh, the best thing that could happen is you have monk rehearsal. Do you ever have a monk rehearsal? Yeah? Monk rehearsal is nobody talks. <laughs> nobody talks, including the conductor. So you want to tell them where to start? You say bar number, or you just put up two fingers. And they go to that place, all right? So no talk. And even that violates is in detention. <laughs> so the, the business of uh, interpretation involves uh, a lot of study uh, on the conductor's part. Um, I guess you could break it down into research, analyzing, and then making some decisions. So research, um, I'll give you an example of it in a moment. Um, analyzing comes to about form, harmonics, um, 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 every gesture that is in the score needs to be to say it, the phrasing particularly. Fortunately, um, I taught at Michigan State for a while, and there was one theory teacher who I adored because he would always bug me before the start of the, the semester about what what are you what are you what are you doing with the orchestra? What are you doing? Oh well, I told him. So he would use that music in his classes as he would use any other, but then, of course, the students that were in the orchestra in his class came out with a whole new other idea, and it was really quite spectacular. So the other thing that, uh, in our era, um, everyone believes that uh, research is to go to Google. And there's some information there, but there's no in-depth. There's no in-depth. You cannot pass up um, Maynard um, Ferguson's um, works on Mozart and Beethoven, which are probably, well, they are the best that ever came out. Uh, because that gives you a sense of who the composer is, which is very important. Um, a, a strange story, uh, Bartok wrote the concerto for orchestra in his very last years. In fact, he was very, 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 very ill in the hospital. And a group from the um, Boston Symphony Orchestra came to, an, to interview him and talk to him and give him a commission to write a new work. He got out of the hospital. He wrote the work. And if you follow how the work progresses emotionally, it's from his sickness into the joy of recovery. But have you not in, in, involved with that simple story, you have no idea what's going on. So um, what feeds interpretation is this ability to hear. I call it critical listening. I, I don't mean do you like it or you don't like it. Critically is that you can hear it. I used to play a piece from my first semester con uh, conducting classes. Uh, one page of Benjamin Britten's uh, simple symphony, The Sarabande. 
and say, and I gave them the mu this music page, who knows, a week before. And so I'd say, well, what do you hear that's not on the page? And after the first run through, they all looked at it and said, nothing. Well, listen one more time. Nothing, nothing, nothing. So I said, OK, what about, what about tempo? Well, one person that did, could sense a little bit of tempo change. The more subtle it got, they, as they tried to show them, they had no experience in this. So no one can be a great musician, much less a great conductor, if they're not a critical listener. It's the best teacher you can have. So you have to manage that. Beethoven said, to play without passion is inexcusable. And I think we're robbing the students more than anything else. And in a sense, of course, the audiences. Uh, the audience will still clap anyway. Uh, if you use that as the gauge of good performance, you're completely wrong. It's your criteria. But to, to leave out the essence of this music and just simply play the page is really criminal. If I go to a concert, I don't care who it is, and I realize that everybody's just playing it, I just leave. I can't take it. A um, lot of the school organizations are involved in contests or festivals. Those, those, those began in 1945. Basically, they have not changed. In fact, they're completely a negative exercise. The judges, strange word, but it, uh, are giving them demerits for what they can't do well. There's nothing positive about it. Uh, there's a small caption on musicality. This has got to change. This is the 20, 2020 year, and we're still not even considering. The whole thing should be about musicality. Whatever you want to mention about what could improve rather than be negative is OK. So that there's really no judging in this. This is so arc archaic and stupid, much less who's going to be first. I don't know why Chicago Symphony and, and New York and Boston don't have a contest. I haven't figured it out. So I mean, this is all possible, but it's in the hands of the people who have allowed this to go on for, for a long time. Why don't they ask the local orchestra director of the professional orchestra to come in? Oh, he's not a band director. Well, I thought you wanted musicians. The people that come in to um, do these, these, these um, experts, band directors, don't know, pay, do not know 90% um, of the works that they're going to hear. Makes no sense. The only thing that they can do is look at the score and tell you what's wrong. They have no idea about should, how the t interpretation should be or not. You should find musicians. If you could get Bob Reynolds to come in, and Craig Kirchhoff, and, and my, my former student, Zach uh, Chiniak, and James, um, um, Matthew James, sorry. Um, those would be the people I want. In fact, forget it. We don't need to have. If you want to have a festival, have a festival. Um, this, this is just a, a, a foolish continuation. Um, I lest last time I was back in the States, um, was listening to one of these with some of the groups I like. And they, they're very good. Uh, but they played one movement of the symphony. And I said, aren't you ever going to play the other ones? Well, you know, there's no time to play it in, in this concert because we only have this much music uh, uh, time. This is ridiculous. Um, and then the students never had the experience of playing a symphony. Never. And there's hundreds and hundreds of symphonies that are easily played by a high school orchestra. There's no question about it. So all of this, all of this has to change. Um, I, I think it's uh, interesting to compare uh, conductors and actors. So if you think what the actor goes through is, you know, he reads the script, 
he, she reads the script. Uh, they, they, they start learning about the character. Uh, they, if, if they possibly can, they see videos of the person probably passed away. Um, and they, they become that person. And that's what has to happen in conducting. From all the information about the composer, the work, da 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 da, then you can conduct. Um, kind of a side. Did I bring that with me? Oh no. Well, all right. Um, here I can do this. So marking, marking the score is um, something, I don't know if you've heard of Elizabeth, Elizabeth Green, but she has wonderful books out taught at University of Michigan for many years and created many, many, many wonderful conductors. Um, she marked her score. Anything that had to do with forte was circled in red, and anything that had to do with piano was circled in blue. Well. And then I started seeing other composers using highlighters to come over certain things. So what does that do? It makes you make decisions. It makes you decide on what's important, what's secondary, da 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 da. The other thing you want to do when you finally come with a, an interpretation is to add those marks. Mark the parts of the musicians, not just your score. So for a silly observance, you can see my colorful little um, markings. And sure, does it take any time? But I always learn something. There's a mistake. There's a discussion that needs to be settled. So I always do it. You may have fun with it. A, a very small thing, except it has a lot to do with maintaining. Um, if, if you're used to uh, talking to the students and say, now you have to watch me more. I said that today, but never mind. Um, you don't want them to watch you. They watch television, or sometimes. They certainly watch their uh and their uh. uh you want them to communicate with you, with you. And so you and I both know that you always communicate with people with your eyes. And that's the only way you can communicate. Well, what are you going to say? They're going to look at you all the time? No, but they can reference you. Or they can use one eye to look at the page and the other eye to look at you. But if they look, if they, if they look up at any time and they see the same thing, why in heavens would they consult the conductor? There is no reason. It's at the beginning and the end only. Or maybe there's a time change. But so. In order to do that while you're conducting, once you get this, you don't want to dip your head to consult the score. You don't have to go, eh. You can just use your eyes. You have the, the score here, and you look down at it. You have the score memorized anyway, which means, at the very least, you know what's on the next page before you turn it. But you, if you do this, you break that concentration. So. That's another hopeful. All right. Um, Holst. Just pull it out of order. Just as an aside, there's a BBC documentary that I invite you all to watch. The first, the first speech, much less a video, that criticized conductors. I thought, oh my, I'm in complete shock. I won't go through any more than that. Uh, it's very interesting, but it, it's also very telling. Um, a really surprising fact was they said, well, there's about 1,500 professional orchestras in the United States. There's only 10 conductors. who really conduct music. Frightfully truthful. Um, all right, let's, let's do our, let's do our hold. <laughs> okay. 
so many conductors say, I can't use my left hand. So the question is, do you eat with two hands? Do you write with two hands? We could go on with the analogies. Of course, you lose, use them separately all the time. Here we go. So the, the minute you're comfortable with that, then you can become more involved with the sound of the music. You don't need to conduct time all the time. So let's try the same, please. And this is, and you can't, this is not choreography. If it doesn't represent your inner soul as to what should happen in the music, it'll be worthless. But it's completely and, and easily done. All you need to have is the motivation. And one, one last thing. One more thing, please. So if, and this is the general thought, that music is between the beats, by doing this, you completely eliminate the possibility of doing that. So controlling the bounds is ridiculous. Here, once more, please. I mean, the music may dic dictate much more energy. That's not the point. But they're bouncing without control just doesn't work. If a piece of music is played exactly as it's written on the page, it doesn't sound bad. It's not, it's not ugly. It, it's nothing. It's not beautiful. It's not sensitive. And it's not emotional. I get you. What's wrong? Well, uh, I've spoken to the composer Malcolm Arnold uh, in London, and I tried to meet with him every time. Uh, but it was great. And he said exactly what I thought he would say. Well, this is inspired by the Scottish, so if you don't know the Scottish, you have no idea what to do with the piece. So it might be this. <laughs> Okay, um, what other part were we going to do? What movement? Four. What was four? <laughs> oh, okay. So, um, one of the things that has to happen is that every line in the score needs to be interpreted. It can't be left alone. It has to be thought through talked about, conducted about, played. Otherwise, it comes back to the banal. So uh, when we get dum da da dum da da dum, can we do that very slowly? In fact, I'm going to conduct each note. Okay, so here we, we, we could give it a shape. It's, there's nothing wrong with it, but let's try it again, same tempo. And, and 
once that's done, the players can pick up the tempo and, and respond. It's much more interesting. There's no way not to do this. Can you play, what, what's the one that goes? Two. 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 Oh, yeah. Can we just do that a little bit? Part, yeah, that's fine. At the at the bassoon part. Letter E, yeah. <laughs> So every time that I tried to get with Mal Malcolm, uh, he was in a recovery, an alcoholic recovery, um, whatever you call it. So you understand that he had first-hand information about this movement. So let's be more drunken. Here we go. No, no, no. Thing. So, uh, She's good. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what he meant. All right, let's go back to the holes, please. So Holst was a very, very, very famous um, English composer. Uh, probably the uh, work that we know the best and love the best is The Planets, which is a spectacular piece. But he wrote all kinds of music, um, particularly um, what were called, excuse me, uh, Morris dances. So I just wanted to show you this because I think this is right. OK, so this is a one of the first publications. It's been around a long time. So it says, second suite for military band in F major, opus da 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 Suite founded on old English country tunes. March, Morris Dance, Swansea Town, Cloudy Banks. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually see Morris Dancers. And if you listen carefully, you'll hear some of the tune that Holst used in his suite, actually from these people. So let's, let's do it like the Morris dancers do it. So if you watch them dance, they're going cha, 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 cha. So that's about, so let's try about that tempo. <laughs> Of course, the nuances that you would get from watching them dance would give you other little actions to feel. Is that better than It's a matter of, of opinion, but it seems to me it completely wipes out the great story that it came from. So uh, Holst, of course, was great friends with all of these people, Von Williams, et cetera, et cetera, who were collecting for the first time indigenous music, which in Mozart's time, no one would touch. Oh, that's way below us. And so it becomes very much a part of this. And so this is very natural for him. It's very interesting. So he named Swansea Town. Here's, is this one I have to sing? Swansea Town, <laughs> somehow I don't have the words, but it doesn't matter. And I'll kind of treat you to my lovely voice. So if you hear a singer sing, 
Can we try? Where is that? You know where it is. Wherever you start, I'll find you. Go. Here we are. Got it? Okay, here we go. Yep. I know you play it beautifully, so this isn't an insult. Okay. So if you notice, he's using what's called rubato. Rubato is to change the time, change the mood, whatever. There's two kinds. One is that the, un the entire ensemble will react to the rubato, and the other is the, like the trombones did, just kept going, and the soloist floated over the top, like Frank Sinatra, huh. right? And he played it beautifully. Uh, let's do a little cloudy. Cloudy banks, what is that, H? Okay. Cloudy Bank. So here's another tune. Okay. So what? So what usually happens? Um, well, just give me the beginning, the old way. <laughs> beginning of the piece. The beginning of the piece. And H. Okay. Okay. So he would have expected, of course, by giving these titles, that the conductor would emulate the emotion and had to change time. He didn't tell you to change time. So as I roved over one evening, all in the month of May, down by the bank of cloudy, I carry less did stray. So, which might sound, eh, Ache? H -H -H -H. Same thing. <laughs> If you haven't noticed, they're very good. <laughs> More than very good. Um, well, we could, we could go on uh, with other things in the holes, but it's a great in investigation and uh, um, a spectacular way. I'm not saying it's right, it's just another one. So one of, one of the most uh, famous works by John Williams, <laughs> besides all the, the <laughs> All the other wonderful pieces know is the music from Schindler's List, the movie. One of the most um, remarkable, uh, heartfelt uh, melody that one can find in all the literature of music. I was telling some of the musicians uh, in our intermission that there was a recording I, I saw um, on YouTube and uh, they featured uh, the English horn player because it's really a duet. Um, and as she's playing, she plays beautifully. Suddenly she starts crying. And she couldn't stop crying. All the way to the end of this short piece, she's crying. And it brings that same reaction from many, many people, much less it's got to be one of the greatest films ever created. And I know the first time I saw it, in fact, I just saw it again thinking, I want to see this again, and I had tears in my eyes. It's impossible to resist. Let's do a little of profanation. Um, almost 
every group, if not every group, uh, comes in contact with what's called multimeter. All of you conductors know what it means. And uh, they all work very hard to give indications where these times change and how they feel. Some, somewhat like this. Okay, but the reality is if the group can't play it without the conductor, they can't play it anyway. So it's, it's not only redundant, it doesn't allow for any expressivity. So let's try it one more time. I'm exaggerating, of course. But so it's another, a, a, another exercise uh, in kind of jumping over the need to constantly beat this uh, multimeter and actually conduct the music. Strauss. Uh, particularly in the, in the band world, there's two um, elements that do not help them make music. And that is that the most expressive gesture in music is a diminuendo. And string players have this wonderful accidental ability to give a bow, a one stroke bow, and at the end of this they have to slow down or they're going to just fall off. And automatically the sound diminuendos. And that fits so much of the music, if not all the music. Wind bands are like organs. They can sustain forever. Wonderful. I mean, the sound, there's no better sound than a great wind ensemble playing something that's so beautifully lengthy. No question about it. Orchestras are great, but they're better at that. So I thought I'd play just a little bit of an earlier piece. I think most band directors only identify with the history that came from marches. Of course, march is, a march is also a form, but we forget that. And of course, way back in when, uh, wind, mu wind players were playing in Greece and, and Rome, and so there was always wind music. Uh, the other side of the development of instrumental being non-string uh, music uh, came from many composers, Mozart, uh, Beethoven, uh, on and on. And, um, Richard Strauss as well. His first, very first piece, his opus, well, it was his opus seven, but f first piece for winds. It's just a glorious piece that any high school, good high school group of winds could make play. Somehow it doesn't get. So we're going to give you a little taste of it. It's okay. 
I know, I'd like them to have it all. It's a gorgeous piece. Uh, and I just have to tell you that they were put, the music were put on the folder. They looked at it once and played it. So that's why this is a professional wind ensemble. So I encourage you uh, not only to listen, but to get involved with, with that. Um, lastly, probably, no, not probably, the most famous Latin piece of music by Arturo Marquez uh, is called Danzón Número Dos. Um, not, there's not an orchestra in the world that hasn't played this, much less many, many times. Um, unfortunately, we're not going to play it all for you, but you've got to go listen to this. Uh, probably the most exciting is with uh, Durumel and his Simon Boulevard Orchestra. Uh, you just, it, people at the end go crazy. But here we are, here's a little bit of this. She's really good. She makes all the expression because she's such a great musician. That's part of it. The other thing is, comes back to the idea that you can add portato, articulate within that, and not. Um, obviously, in order to be able to play this with any sensibility, you have to be very f familiar with Mexican music and their dances and watch them dance and listen to the style. Because, you know, it, if you listen a lot, you just automatically play it. But here's one way to do it. And I'm thinking I could do it in two for you, but I won't. OK, here we go. Mm. <laughs> I mean, that's, uh, they're, they're playing exactly what's on the page. So we're going to ask them to play the accents stronger and the non-accents much less. One less time. <laughs> and if we can make more exaggeration in one, two, three, four, da, 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 rather than da, 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 is there. Same. Okay. okay. So once you're dancing with the Mexicans, you're going to see that when they hear this, they're going to play bum 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 like you were going to play it. Here we go. Don't drag, don't drag, push. Sorry, less staccato, more sustained, please. <laughs> I promised afterwards that I was going to buy tequila, so they'll have no excuse. Uh, I just want to give you a couple of uh, quotes. Um, one of the great interpreters of the 20th, 21st century was a conductor by the name of Nicholas Harnicourt, who died a couple of years ago. His insightful uh, interpretations ushered into the symphonic repertoire, a new approach to interpretation. Here are some of the statements he made. So he was talking about rehearsals, and he said, you know, repetition in rehearsal is like covering it with wax. It removes all the excitement and musicality. So there's most people, most conductors have a routine. Uh, could be chorales, tuning, 
uh, scales, um, oh, I, all of which are wonderfully good. Do it again, do it every day. Nobody pays any attention. Why not start at the end of the piece and go backwards? I don't mean play it backwards, but uh, find a place else. Hand out a new piece of music and sight read something. Better yet, spend much more time listening to great music and wasting, huh, no, and having your players listen to music. They never listen to anything. The only thing they ever hear is one recording done by a commercial band playing the piece they're playing, which of course they just played very well and left it there. What were they going to do? They don't go to concerts unless they're forced. My high school band director used to say, hey, I'm going to a concert. How many would like to go? Me, 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 me. I bet we went to 10 concerts a year with him. With him. Uh, that doesn't happen anymore. Everybody's worried about insurance. There's a, way, there's a way around it. There's a way around it. You have to understand that there was, um, I, I won't call it a competition, but uh, a set of instructions that allowed oh, a young player, shall we say, practice, uh, let, let's just say 45 minutes a day. Uh, one did that, and the other one spent half that time listening to music. So at the end of six weeks, they, they played. Who won? The one that, which one? The one? Right, the one that was listening to music was considerably better than the other. What a waste of time. Practice what? No concept, no idea. If the players aren't listening to great performance to develop an idea of what their instrument sounds like, they have no, nothing to do. They just keep practicing the same thing they're always doing, which gets them absolutely nowhere. So that, uh, there's some great videos. Uh, Michael Tilson Talonless has a, a series of fabulous about composers and, and uh, examples of orchestras called Keeping Score. You can't play it all in one, one class, but you could pull it out. Is that worth it? It's worth 10,000 of the other uh, days of just repetition. It's a waste of time. So Harnon Court says, uh, impossibilities are the most beautiful possibilities. Music should rip the soul apart. Art is a pretty accessory. Isn't, <laughs> isn't a pretty accessory. It's the umbilical cord that connects us with the divine. It surely and ensures our humanity. To be beautiful, music must operate in the outer fringes of catastrophe. Catastrophe. I said this something to the band earlier. He says, with jazz singers like Frank Sinatra, Sinatra, I started wondering why do they sing that way and why does a classical singer stand there and just sing the notes? Dang if I know. That's not true of all of them. Go listen to Cecilia Bartoli. You'll never have a better experience. This is interesting because the truth is that professional orchestra players end up to be completely burned out. Do they play? Do they play well? Yes, but they, they, they only do it to make a buck. Why? You have, certainly, all of the players in that orchestra are great musicians, have ideas about the music, uh, probably better than the conductors, who knows? Well, they could all play their interpretation, but of course, in, in a mix, it would be a muddle. So there, is, there needs to be leadership. So uh, Harnoncourt says, a musician is a great individualist. Any musician, when he chooses this profession, he had a picture about what is music and what is his or her role as an interpreter, as a virtuoso player on his instrument. And to play in a group with another man telling them, when he didn't include women, I'm sorry, uh, him how to play 
is the great frustration in that profession. And so I think it is important not to just tell the musicians what to do, but also to explain why you had come to this opinion and encourage the musicians to like this interpretation at least at the minute. So, of course, we're left out. It's, there's, a, there's a great series of, of rehearsals on YouTube. Go watch this. He talks about why he has an idea. So the beginning of the Fifth Symphony, everybody knows. Sometimes it's played, da 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 Other times it's played, da 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 He said, no, 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 it has to be da 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 This is Beethoven's rebellion of people in chains. You can't divest yourself of that image. Wow, did the orchestra come to that? So we can explain why the music is, share what we found in our research, talk about the composer, where they were, stop wasting time. So the, the obvious, um, we already said, um, conducting is not choreography. I see students in the hallway going, no, no thinking. So at the very least, never practice any gesture without music in your mind. In fact, it's not the gesture you're, you're doing. So if I think, I think, you know, there needs to be a crescendo here, and I feel it here, I can show that. I don't have to consult anybody or look in the mirror. If you can uh, just express yourselves, you have to look like the music. My conducting teacher from my undergraduate work came out to see my junior high school <laughs> band, which is my first gig. And he uh, was very confident, nice, nice rehearsal. We were over lunch, and he said, but there's only one thing. You don't look like the music. And it was like being slapped in the head. I didn't have any idea, but I started to look. So you conduct the sound and feel of the music. I, um, um, I don't know. Play your favorite, favorite note, please. Everybody, pick, pick your note. So, excuse me, I, I can tell them all kinds of things, but showing them is a whole other thing. So, here we go. Stop looking down, please. You know, I, I did this earlier, but I noticed that sometimes I need to change batons. So, excuse me. Here we go. I could explain those for months, but I can do it much more effectively by gesture. One I like that Richard Wagner said is, never look at the trombones. It only encourages them. <laughs> <clears throat> Pablo Casals was a wonderful, what? Cellist, yeah, and conductor. Um, completely baffling the people who heard him play the unaccompanied suites of Bach, where no one had ever explored it the way he did musically. But <laughs> I just had it. What happened to it? Ah. There are many qu wonderful quotes of his, but it, he, he said, Remember that all music in general is a succession of rainbows. Diminuendo is the life of music. The art of interpretation is not to play what is written. So, I'm hoping that um, what we've discussed today and, and what you've seen um, 
will open a door for you and that you can share all of these wonderful things. That you're not doing it is not your fault. You weren't, there was no instruction. There's some wonderful clinics that go along. Most of them just deal with how you move your arms. And, and that's good, that's okay, that's fine. But um, if you can embody all of the things we've talked about and particularly for your, your musician's sake, let them experience what great music feels like. And you'll find that they'll continue as listeners and players probably in the future. I want to say lastly that this group <laughs> is first of all spectacular. They've been wonderful. They are wonderful. There's no way to thank them for doing this with me and um, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you.